From Chicago's CAN TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs, and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And hello, welcome to another edition of Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis here on CAN TV. It's been a busy week, uh, as you as you probably know, Governor. Uh, our governor has, has uh, signed the Illinois uh, death penalty uh, ban, uh, but our former governor uh, has asked uh, to go to jail or something like that. If, if we could, uh, he could cut a deal so he wouldn't have to go to another trial. There's a lot of other things going on, of course. Uh, Terry Mazzani saying that the uh, education system is in free fall. But we begin with um, our uh, mayor-elect, who, uh, who is apparently going around the city trying to decide which of the 14 aldermanic races he wants to participate in in a financial sort of way and over at the reader uh, Steve Bagheera claims that he's actually gotten hold of a copy of the questionnaire that the mayor has sent out to every to all of the candidates asking them uh, a few questions so he can decide how much money he wants to give them and uh, my favorite question was what is your favorite bird the eagle the hawk the owl or the parrot. <laughs> you decide, and maybe you'll get 50K if you answer it correctly. <laughs> Joining us today to discuss this and everything else uh, for the second week in a row, Hunter Klaus is with us from the uh, Chicago News Cooperative. Thanks for coming back again, because we, 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 we started talking about this last week and decided we had to carry it on, so we, we brought you back. Ramson Cannon is with us from Gaper's Block. Glad to have you back again, Ramson. We got a lot of things to talk about. And we have a financial expert with us today because we have Cindy Canary with us from the, uh, the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform. And uh, Cindy, I know you were on the program a while ago before the main election, and we had lots to talk about. So I thought we'd um, begin our conversation there today. Uh, we've observed in the past, and others have too, that there is a lot of money sloshing around in this what would otherwise be a kind of an innocent little you know by election just these 14 uh, runoffs between two people that might not get much notice outside of the public library in that in that ward but uh, now all of a sudden there are millions of dollars so um, we want to try to figure this out today who are the players who are who are the big players who are trying to influence these 14 elections well, there are potentially millions of dollars. The millions of dollars seem to be, you know, sitting over here waiting, waiting to get to the candidates. They certainly are. Uh, Mayor-elect Emanuel has indicated he will put some substantial money into races. There's a group called For a Better Chicago that was very active in uh, the initial election, and it actually has been putting some money in uh, the runoffs. Um, we heard just recently that Ed Burke decided that he will dip into his $8 million and be a player as well. And then, of course, there's the unions, SIU, right. ASME. Potentially, we are talking about millions of dollars that could come into some of these communities. Whether or not it actually happens or happens on that scale, I have some doubts. Mm -hmm. Well, it does seem like... Um he, he, on the on the night of the election, it looked like whoa, we've got 14 big races, but the, it seems to me the temperature has cooled rather dramatically on these races. I mean, you kind of know where most of them are going, and some of them, I guess, really, I, it's a terrible thing to say, but they don't really seem to matter all that much because, you know, they're not going to be big players in the overall scene. Ramson? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think a number of the runoffs. Are, were between you know one candidate who got really close to the majority and uh, the, whoever the straggler was, and so you know they have a, a mountain to climb in terms of getting all the voters. You don't tend to add new voters, obviously, for the runoff, so um, they've got a, a, a way to go. Those challengers to to pull together a coalition to try to take on those incumbents. So I think uh, uh, on election night, everybody was kind of shocked or surprised or. Mm -hmm excited depending on you know mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where you were uh, that there were all these runoffs but uh, it, it's really narrowed to a handful that are going to be competitive or interesting yeah I, I I turn to you because it just so happens by coincidence you and I were on a panel on the radio uh, uh, an hour or so after Rahm Emanuel had been declared and mm -hmm. I I'll speak for myself it just seemed like this was a 
big, big historic moment, these, these 14 Titanic races that mm -hmm. we're going to be watching. And now here we are a couple of weeks out, and it's like, well, we know this one, you know, this one's settled, this one's settled, and, and then it just doesn't seem like it's quite the same. So maybe this notion that, this, the, that these buckets and buckets of money are going to be sloshing into these races, maybe it's not going to happen. I, I, I'm not sure that, that, the, that despite the way we might have felt on election night that it ever really was titanic. If we look at how endorsements and money has been lining up in the aldermanics from the get-go, what we've seen is an incredible concentration of unlikely people endorsing the same candidates. Yeah, so we're not yeah. seeing what we saw in 2007 where SEIU says, we're going to make you a policy-making body, you're going right. to fight for the living wage, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and Walmart and all the, that, exactly. those issues. This right. looks a lot more like, hey, let's all back the winners. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Right, well, we saw that this week with the Chicago Federation of Labor backing um, Alderman Danny Solis. Danny Solis, yeah. yeah. Which was um, somewhat surprising because um, his opponent in that race, uh, Mr. Morphin, um, had, um, you know, um, garnered some union support in that ward. Mm -hmm. So um, He had CTU, uh, CTA, I mean, and, and a couple and of the, uh, I believe the teachers union as well had also backed him. Um, and in 2007, the unions were going after um, Danny Solis. Um, so it is interesting that they're kind of um, following each other's lead. Well, let's let's just uh, detour out there to the the fine twenty seventh ward for uh, uh, the twenty uh, fifth yeah. ward. I mean, not twenty seventh, and take a look at that because there was a big issue there with the with the coal fired power plant. I mm -hmm. He has Fisk right in his ward. Mm -hmm. You're right. Uh, I always get uh, Fisk and Crawford confused, but but he has Fisk, and and he had not been in favor of legislation that would. Well, it's the city council. They don't really have the ability to control emissions from power plants. That's the feds. But city council wanted to take a stand on this, and he was not in favor of that. And then one morning he woke up, and he was suddenly in favor of it again, mm -hmm. you're, or you're, in mm -hmm. favor of it. And that seems to have changed the dynamic of money coming mm -hmm. into his campaign. He also likes owls. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Alderman Solis said that he had um, consulted with SCIU and that there was some sort of understanding that um, he would be supporting the Clean Power Ordinance um, should he get reelected. Um, of course, the chief sponsor of that ordinance, uh, Alderman Joe Moore on the north side, um, is like, why wait? Why don't we just do it right now? Right. right. But that's a, but that's just a, a kind of an interesting event that happened there because, um, I mean, there's just there's just been so much kind of mm -hmm. flip flopping and changing around over there. And it's also interesting to me that uh, Mr. Morphin is 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 a a real community organizer and and the kind of guy that you would think some progressive organizations would want to line up behind and, and throw some money behind. But I guess the numbers just don't add up, and that seems to be what we're seeing in a lot of races. I mean, think of, you know, just, just to name one, uh, t uh, Tim Cullerton, for example. You've got a lot of these people who, are, who were two or three points mm -hmm. away, maybe even one point away from 50, and you've got their challenger who was at 19 or 20 or 21 points, and so who's, gonna, who's yeah. really going to seriously mm -hmm. try to help them? Yeah, I think Solis needed 95 of Medrano's votes, the, the third place runner up. So, he, you know, he's, he's right there. What's interesting is that Ambi Medrano is actually now helping Morphin, mm -hmm. and from what I've been told, actually out there door to door mm. trying to bring support. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of dynamic mm -hmm. and division mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. ward. Mm -hmm. um, whether that will show up in the polls, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, it's a very feisty ward. Yeah, I mean, um, last year we saw the Whittier standoff where mm -hmm. um, Chicago Public Schools wanted to demolish a, um, a field house at the elementary school out there, and um, a group of parents and protesters were not thrilled with that plan, and they came out and, and occupied the building for quite some time. I believe over a month it was uh, it went on. Um, I believe Mr. Morphine was also involved with that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the organizers of that whole um, uh, standoff have thrown their support behind him. Mm -hmm. um, Alderman Danny Solis tried to come to some solution. He tried getting the district to agree to one of like three plans. I can't remember all of them, but um, <clears throat> the parents wanted a library in the field house. I believe one right. of the plans called for the library actually in the school. 
Um, and that kind of backfired on him. Um, a lot of the protesters and parents felt that um, Solis was um, meddling into something that they wanted to solve themselves. Um, however, if that actually translates into votes in the runoff, um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. an, an, interesting, um, <clears throat> an interesting case on the other side of that was um, um, yesterday, uh, Mark Brown's column, when he, he, he wrote about the 36th War, John Rice, and uh, the uh, gentleman who's a firefighter who's running against him and, and is like 20 points down and, and you know, sort of like, here's one place where the underdog might be able to do it. But, of course, John Rice uh, has a lot of, uh, well, he's got Rahm, anyway, in, in, on his side. And, who and knows he's who got the committeeman William J.P. Banks on right, his side as right, well. Right. Uh, Rice had a beautiful quote in that column, something to the effect of, why are they making me do this? I could be taking this money and putting it into parks and swimming pools for my community. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, right, which I'm sure he intended to do. <laughs> so I, to try to keep uh, focused on this, on this money thing for a minute here, we, have, we, we haven't really talked very much about this Greg Goldner for a Better Chicago Committee. Now, again, this is one of these things a week ago, even just, just sitting at this table a week ago, this was uh, sort of the big boogeyman. Everybody seemed to be very concerned about this. And now I, I'm not, I mean, the Tribune did, uh, on the day that we were shooting this program last Thursday, they did a front page thing about this secret organization that was backing Rahm Emanuel. And then within 24 hours, Rahm had said, no, I want them to disclose who their funders are. And then he created his own group. And we have seen that, we've seen For a Better Chicago kind of recede into the shadows again, but what, what is it? Well, For Better Chicago is, is a group, well, we don't know what it is because they have not disclosed who their donors are, but it is led by uh, Greg Goldner, who has uh, experience with the uh, daily campaigns. He's the head of Resolute Consulting. They raised... And, and Emmanuel's campaigns. And Emmanuel's campaigns as well, and, and they raised about $850,000, $860,000 in the fall. They formed right after the daily announcement. Right before the new law went into effect, they transferred a lump sum of $855,000 from For a Better Chicago to the For a Better Chicago PAC and started dispersing that money. And you, you may, I, I have to stop you because you talked about the new law. Now, I know that's something you've been very concerned about. You need to tell us what the new law is. Oh, I'm going to get wonky. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can handle that. Okay. Yeah. As, of, as of January 1st, to, just to keep it simple, Illinois, for the first time, has contribution limits. So... As we saw, Rahm and the other candidates, particularly Rahm, did a, a masterful job of raising huge contributions, $100,000 contributions, up to December 31st. As of December 31st, there are limits in the size they can raise. Um, the Goldner Group has uh, refused to say who their donors are. We, um, you know, Truth in Advertising, my group, the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, has filed a complaint with the State Board of Elections we had a preliminary hearing on that on Monday. Um, we, you know, we will see. Um, our concern really is that it is critical that people know the source of funds if you want to judge the veracity of a message. Um, the Goldner Group is arguing, making what I, I find to be a very strange argument, that labor unions do this all the time. Um, well, first of all, For a Better Chicago is not a labor union as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, secondly, labor unions have to file all of their donors and the names with the U.S. Department of Labor, so we actually do have access to that. And thirdly, we're looking at small donations taking out of, taken from member dues that are aggregated and that's allowed under the law. Um, perhaps Mr. Goldner aggregated lots and lots and lots of $10 donations. Um, mm -hmm. But he certainly hasn't reported and also, that. And also, if you if you get a contribution from the SEIU, you know you're getting a contribution from the SEIU. Yes. But if you get a contribution from For a Better Chicago, you just don't really have. There's no real way of knowing. Is, yeah. Am I right about that? Yeah. That that, uh, that comparison that that he tried to draw there shows either ignorance of how unions work or hostility to them. Uh, I mean, you know, the average. Donation that comes into the pack of, like, say, an SEIU or an AFSCME from a member is maybe fifteen, twenty dollars, yeah. like Cindy was saying, uh, versus you know the hundred thousand to two hundred thousand to half a million dollar checks that this organization may be getting, that it's not disclosing, and that is sort of protected under the the regime uh, 
that came down after the Citizens United decision last year. I guess we would we would contend uh, certainly the giving is is protected under mm -hmm. that regime. We contend very strongly that the disclosure is necessarily. And I was yeah. very struck when Mayor Elect Emanuel said, um, very grateful when he said, I think they should disclose, but very struck when he said referred to a quirk in the law. <laughs> I think if anyone should be sensitive to what he perceives as quirks in the law, it should be the guy who took a quirk to the, U the, the Illinois Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So where, where do we stand at this point with, with um, Ron Emanuel has, has now, he, he said they have to disclose whether or not they did slash will is, is still up in the air. But then it seemed to me mysteriously suddenly announced his own pack. I mean, did, did we see that coming? Is that, is that just a routine thing that, that just is a legality that he has to do in order to transfer money? Or, or did he create something new out of thin air? Well, Alderman Edward Burke has numerous committees. Mm -hmm. I mean, Rahm Emanuel is by no means revolutionizing the right. way of, <laughs> of mm -hmm. making donations to these, these elections or these campaigns. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Burke has already put some money in some of his yeah. colleagues' um, political action or um, campaign committees. Um, you know, he's got one called the Burnham Committee. And yes. He's a very, um, mm -hmm. he's very much in love with history. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's just a nice little touch. But um, um, I, you know, I think everyone was, you know, watching to see if the Emanuel campaign would be signing checks directly into these mm -hmm. um, into mm -hmm. these runoffs. Well, I guess that I guess that's really my question. Is, is I, I just don't have any clue how the law works on this. It, Rahm Emanuel sitting on a bunch of money. If he wanted to just donate money to John Arena or somebody, could he just write a check, or, or is there a legal thing that has to be done? He has to create a. He he w within limits. He could make donations. He also can start a new fund as he has done. Um, but he raised much of the money in his existing fund um, in increments way beyond the limit. So he can continue to spend that money on his campaigns. I think he is playing it legally safe um, by creating a new fund, not only playing it legally safe, but inviting a whole lot of new donors in mm -hmm. and saving his stockpile. So, so that's one of the things that the the Rahm Emanuel Fund is has said is that they're going to they have a limit of fifty thousand that they can transfer to us as a pack, yes, as a pack. But they're not going to use his money for that, whether legally or that's by their choice. They're going to go out and raise it from new people, from new from new donors, and I presume they will disclose who those donors I, are. I, they they will disclose who those donors are, and I think that it is you know in part about Rahm. Mayor-elect Emanuel, I have to yeah. keep remembering <laughs> to be more formal. That's right. Um, right. Mayor-elect Emanuel right. continuing to build his base as the expert fundraiser he is mm -hmm. within the Chicago metropolitan community. So, right. mm -hmm. so I mean, if, if he's got whatever it is, if he's got five or six uh, races that he really cares about and uh, he's got to raise $50,000, that's, that's a, a few phone calls for the, the Rahm Emanuel campaign, I would imagine. It would happen pretty quickly. And, and we have to remember that $50,000 in a lot of these wards is a flood of money. Yeah, it As, is. Particularly yeah. when we look at a runoff, right. you're looking at so few votes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, some of, some some wards had four thousand total yeah. votes in them. So it, it's if, worse. If, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so mm -hmm. if you're gonna if you're gonna donate fifty thousand dollars to influence four thousand votes, uh, just stand on the corner and hand out checks. <laughs> wouldn't that be wouldn't that be more efficient? Illegal, but efficient. <laughs> I think one of the uh, one question I had actually about this is that uh, while there's these new limits as to how much can go into candidate committees, mm -hmm. in terms of just electioneering. Um, if, if For a Better Chicago wanted to spend money uh, mm -hmm. against a candidate in public messages without necessarily giving it to the candidate, there mm -hmm. is no expenditure limit. That's right. That right. The, the, the U.S. Supreme Court um, basically has said that you can do independent expenditures mm -hmm. so long as they're not coordinated with the, the mm -hmm. candidate or that candidate's campaign. We have seen a number of independent expenditures um, in this last cycle, mm -hmm. where it really boggles the mind, this notion that things are not coordinated. <laughs> and I, I believe we'll be back at the Board of Elections to discuss that soon. <laughs> that, might be, that might be the rationale behind f uh, forming this second committee by mm -hmm. Ron, which I is to, to put a sort of 
wall of separation mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. uh, for a better Chicago and himself. Uh, but again, when you're talking about something, uh, uh, I want to get off this topic. But when you're <laughs> when you're talking about something at an aldermanic level, if you have tens and tens of thousands of dollars to spend on a kind of a negative campaign against you know somebody who got 20 percent of 4,000 votes how do you do that you just put up <laughs> billboards I mean is it, is it I guess it's direct mail and direct robocalls and yeah. that kind of thing right mm -hmm. yeah. door knockers so all right Governor Quinn Governor Quinn has done it he's he he spent several months he thought about the uh, death penalty ban for a good long time talked to a lot of people and came to what he considers to be a a considered and moral opinion. Did he do the right thing? All eyes turn to you. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, uh, I don't know why yeah. everybody looked at you. So, oh, well, um, I'm not going to label it good or bad. But um, you know, the governor said that it was one of the toughest decisions that he's ever had to make, um, and you can see it by the reaction that he got after he signed it. Um, of course, the Republicans were not um, too pleased with his decision. But um, a couple of high-profile Democrats also ridiculed mm -hmm. the governor. Mm -hmm. um, chief among them, um, Attorney General Lisa Madigan, Absolutely. Um, Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez, Alvarez yes. um, Mayor Daley has been um, hasn't been too pleased. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor Elect Emanuel, however, um, thought it was a good decision. Mm -hmm. um, I think those those people criticizing him uh, that are uh, that are high up, particularly Attorney General Madigan and uh, State Attorney Alvarez, who are concerned with prosecuting the law, uh, are going to end up on the wrong side of this one. The, the entire history of the death penalty in you know, the United States and in England before that is a history of narrowing it and eliminating it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's probably a reason for that. You know, it's a 500, 600 year history of getting rid of it, uh, mm -hmm. narrowing it down. Uh, you know, it used to be ed any felony would get you yeah, capital punishment. Yeah. And now, now yeah. it's been narrowed, narrowed to the point where we're eliminating it. And that's probably for a good reason. It's it's not social engineering or some crazy new trend, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Are I was there? so struck this morning on uh, listening to the radio that it has been 11 years since um, former governor now imprisoned governor George Ryan mm -hmm. put the mor moratorium in place. Yeah, that is pretty strange. Um, it was 11 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's time flies. Yeah. Um, and and I have always been one who thought that on his part that was a considered decision, and mm -hmm. I believe it was a considered decision on Quinn's part. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was uh, it was a considered decision. Th there is a I do get a, a sense as I as I look at this this morning that there is something historic going on here, and that there is a sort of a, uh, a moving forward of history, and that this is the this is the side that history will be on mm -hmm. if you look back on it in thirty years, fifty years, or whatever. So our other governor. Governor Blagojevich <laughs> has asked for, I don't really, frankly, adm I'll admit, I don't really exactly understand what it is that he asked for, but it, it, <laughs> he wants to uh, have the old trial go back into effect so that he can be punished for the one count that he was found guilty on. And he's only doing this because he wants to save the taxpayers of Illinois so much money oh, that they would have to pay to retry him. So. Is, we're, we're probably all in favor of uh, saving that money, right? I'm not. <laughs> See, there you go again. I, I you know, I, I say spend. that, that tax, I'm a tax and spend liberal. I think there are some, <laughs> some things like um, the prevention of corruption that are worth investing in. Mm -hmm. And um, does, does anybody around this table actually think that this, I've heard it called ploy, uh, <laughs> has, has any chance at all of surviving in the court of justice? I mean, will, will, will the judge go along with this? Is this going to happen? Oh, there was just like a cascade of legal experts who were saying that they didn't think this was going to go absolutely anywhere. I, I've, I've not heard anybody who knows more about the law than perhaps many of us do uh, who said anything otherwise but this is this is just a ploy and it, it's it's even even for even for Blagojevich it's a kind of a stretch and and Judge Zagel is a very serious committed judge and and I don't think that he will look kindly on this um all right let's talk about Walter Burnett Walter <laughs> Burnett has resigned <laughs> as the um whatever he was the chairman of mm -hmm. the Black Caucus and the City Council and uh, he's, he's listed a number of reasons why he's done that, but I, I thought one that was missing from his list was that he was the guy who kind of brought us the consensus candidate fiasco. Uh, is, that, is that overstating it? Well, when I talked to him um, 
you know, he said that um, he just felt like it was, it was time to leave. Um, he was the chairman of the Black Caucus for two years, which is, um, you know, typically how long people um, stay in that position. I believe his predecessor, Kerry Austin, was around for two years. Uh, I'm not sure about old, former Alderman Edward Smith. Um, but um, we did talk about this, you know, search for the consensus <laughs> black mayoral candidate. And um, it did burn him out. He mm -hmm. said that um, he put in a lot of man hours. He certainly did. Um, he really, really <coughs> tried to open up the process to all of the candidates. And um, there was a vote taken with um, the coalition members, and they voted against him on that point. But, um, you know, Alderman Burnett, um, ever since uh, the, the coalition anointed Congressman Danny Davis, and then when he dropped out back Kara Mosley Braun, uh, Burnett has kind of had this, you know, bittersweet look on that yeah. whole yeah. that whole process. Yeah, yeah. Um, he maintains that Danny Davis was the consensus candidate. Um, when he dropped out, he did not follow Davis's lead and endorse Kara Mosley Braun. Right, right. And in fact, um, Alderman Burnett's um, mentor, uh, Secretary of State Jesse White, mm -hmm. Uh, was the first big, prominent African American mm -hmm. um, elected official to back um, Rahm Emanuel's yeah, mayoral, mayoral right. bid, and he just got five thousand dollars today. Yeah, and he from the Emanuel campaign. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No connection, of course. No <laughs> connection. But make that clear. Um, Ramson, maybe you ought to. Maybe we ought to talk, turn to you to talk about Terry Mazzani. Terry Mazzani, uh, rather. You know, stark quote in the Tribune: "The system is in free fall." Then he went on Chicago Tonight to say, "Oh no, I didn't mean that. I just, right. I just meant that there was a lot of change going on." What's going on with him? <coughs> well, uh, excuse me. I think, uh, uh, you know, I think Terry Mazzini is a pretty um, uh, astute guy, and I think he's he genuinely wants to do a really good job. And I think he's. I think we should be lauding him for telling the truth, which is mm -hmm. that the, the school system is in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And he's got this window of opportunity to bring some of those issues to light and, um, uh, you know, try to start something that will, you know, make it incumbent on the next uh, administration to act on mm -hmm. some of those problems and bring them to light now and, um, you know, setting things in motion will make it harder to just ignore them. In the new is, there, is there any so. significance to the fact that he wasn't put on the transition committee that, that's talking about education? I mean, there's a lot of people who've made a big deal out of that. It seems to me like, well, you know, so what? I mean, he is the interim director. He was brought in to right. run the place. He's got a day job. He's yeah. running the district. Yeah. I mean, um, no one, no, none of the other department heads were on this government reinvention committee that yeah. the yeah. manual camp yeah. has. Um, so sometimes we just <coughs> get excited and animated about things. Well, I mean, one thing that was interesting that um, I believe Catalyst pointed out was that um, the teachers' union wasn't was on, on the right. transition right. team. Mm -hmm. and, and for that matter, I think there was only like one union on both committees That's that right. was represented. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we, we usually try to run down this ladder of all these things <laughs> going on <laughs> in the week, and, it, and it, uh, it all, we always run out of time at the end. But Cindy Canary, thanks so much Thank for joining you. us today from the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform. And, uh, uh, well, Rams and Cannon, let's, let's thank you first because you're sitting here through uh, your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your cold and, and not feeling very well. And uh, um, uh, Hunter Klaus uh, from Chicago News Cooperative, thanks for being with us today. Uh, you've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of CAN-TV. You can find us right here on cable. You know that. But you can see this and other programs on cantv.blip.tv. Or you can check us out on iTunes. You can download. You can uh, move in with us and live with us, whatever you <laughs> <laughs> We're yours. We'll do whatever you want. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week on Chicago Newsroom.